it's it's a pretty interesting topic and i think i think politics generally evokes a lot of opinion and debate and discussion so it'll be great if we can have this as an interactive session we are three panelists here distinguished in their fields from different parts of asia who will be able to offer varying perspectives on what's happening in the region and globally and the implications of that on the region and certain sub regions but it'll be great to have you interject at any point of time if you disagree if you have a different opinion or if you have questions when we look at the future of asian geopolitics uh it it's a pretty interesting time i think when i first saw the topic you know there are a few things that immediately stand out and the panelists will in turn talk about these different things one of course is with the ongoing trade conflict between the us and china and tensions around the economy what are the implications of that not only on these two economies but on asia at large what are the implications of that in terms of how things are playing out between china and japan which professor taknaka will be speaking about and its its implications on other parts of asia as well for example asean which some people seem to be of the view that will benefit from the ongoing trade conflict or some economies in the region may benefit from it there are other issues that you know that have plagued the region in the recent past which south china sea is one of them but i think i think what is very important and this is something which frank wanted with this discussion is to look at all of this in the context of how closely intertwined the economies of the region are and while there is a lot of talk and rhetoric about potential hotspots conflict zones and the potential for conflict you know, what what is it that we are really seeing what are the chances of something like that blowing out of proportion given how closely the economies of this region need to work perhaps more so than ever before need to work closely so i just like to very briefly introduce our panelists we've had a few of our panelists who haven't been able to make it due to flight cancellations so so to my left we have mr kopsak chutikul who's a former ambassador and member of parliament in thailand with years of distinguished service representing thailand at various international organizations including the united nations to my right we have ma'am nin she's president of the ho chi minh peace ho chi minh city peace and development foundation vietnam again with years of distinguished service in vietnam and in the region uh miss nin will be talking a little bit more about predictability i will leave that more to her and and we have professor harukata taknaka from the national graduate institute of policy studies in japan professor will be talking about about what's happening between the us and china potential implications on the region and your know, where japan comes into this scheme of things as an important player in the region without taking any more any more of your time i'd like to open this up to our panelist uh mr mr chutikul we'll start with you when what we'd like to know is when you first saw the topic and what were the two or three first themes that struck you or that you thought would warrant discussion thank you mr poda Well, when I first saw the topic, as you said, I'm a, well, I was a member of parliament, uh, elected one, uh, if I can say, but I'm no longer. So what first struck me was, what can I say that will not get me into jail? Because at this time, at this moment, uh, we can't campaign, we can't say much, uh, because there was a coup d'etat. And Thailand, unfortunately, is the only country in Asia now that is ruled by a military regime so we can say that things change all the time uh situations in the region change all the time issues of what is democracy uh what is the best form of governance uh for a long time we thought liberal 
world order, democracy, human rights, was, as President Obama might say, on a tangent. Uh, it's a sort of the arc of the universe bending <laughs> towards human rights and democracy. Now we're not so sure. What is the alternative now? We thought it was the alternative of an authoritarian state. Socialists, their own characteristics, and we in Southeast Asia were quite confident that all oh, that is not an alternative. Our people, our young people especially, will not choose that option because it was not something that they would like to live in their way of life. They want still to go into Google, they want to look at YouTube, uh, they want to enjoy the benefits of a modern lifestyle. But in all of that now, the other alternative of an open, liberal society, democratic human rights, who is championing that now? The world seems to be turned on its head. Of course, we all realize at the back of our minds this clash, perhaps, of civilization or at least a form of governance. We don't mention names. Usually, we always refer to the elephant in the room. But that elephant has turned into a dragon, even bigger than an elephant. But in addition to that dragon, there's also this, this, uh, this uh, Republican elephant, I would say, who is posing, and though the two of them are taking up a lot of room, and for us in this region, I feel that we are feeling cramped, uncertain, unsure of what the future holds. What are the contours of the future that we can discern? Much less can we have a role in deciding what is the future, whether destiny is in our own hands. I would say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that when I saw the topic, I, of course, looked back to last year. What were we talking about last year in Kolkata under geopolitics? We were talking about Kim Jong-un. We were afraid of nuclear war coming. We were afraid of some um, mad guy, a mutually assured destruction, uh, being in charge of the nuclear button. How quickly times have changed. That has gone off, uh, off the radar, off the front pages. Because maybe Singapore did something to them. You gave them some chicken rice or some you know, uh, curry shrimps. Uh, that made them all go away. Uh, but even there, we can see that still, it's still under the surface. There are still questions of whether the arrangements, the understandings reached in Singapore will last. But of course, over one year, we see a more accentuated concern about trade war. So that is the war that we are, of course, all concerned about how it will play out, who will gain, who will lose, what choices do we have to make. But again, we look to Friday. Friday in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Friday, Saturday. Instead of Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump meeting, it will be Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. A change. Uh, uh, of, of, uh, you know, uh, of combatants, perhaps, or, or contestants. What will come out of that? Next year when we meet, will trade war be something, of course, also out of the headlines? But the other concern, of course, I think, when we look at the region around us, the landscape, geopolitical landscape, is that the trade war, uh, what would be the trade-off if we are to lessen that? If China and the United States 
were to say, okay, uh, no more trade war, but we will still compete. Again, we have a situation whereby it's a classical situation of a rising power challenging a status quo power, the number one power, the apex uh, country, uh, the, 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 the dominant uh, country. Of course, there's always historically convulsions, uncertainty, change. But what is fascinating this time is that the rising power, instead of saying, I want to change the status quo and the international order, is now saying, I want to maintain the international order. I want to keep multilateralism. I want to have a liberal economy. I want open and free trade and investment. Whereas the dominant power who had benefited and who had put into place the system that we all know is saying now, hey, this is not working for me. I'm going back to an idyllic time in the past, a status quo ante, not a status quo right now, status quo ante, power politics, great power rivalry, nationalism, bilateral, not multilateral. The concern immediately there, of course, is that in that context, if history teaches us anything, is that when the big powers begin to work on that premise, they invariably accept spheres of influence of each other. Some concern in the United States, of course, is that why is President Trump so sanguine, so nonchalant, let's say, about Putin's threat? Maybe he sees Eastern Europe is a natural sphere of influence of Russia. Why get bothered about it? You know, what is this, all this fake uh, investigation? I didn't, you know, that, that's nothing there. Then, of course, we come to how about China? What is their sphere of influence? Could it be South China Sea? Even though they're saying, no, 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 this is an open lanes of communication, of transport, of trade. And if it's South China Sea, it implies also Southeast Asia as a whole. So that is another big concern. It's not only the trade war, the, because there you have winners and losers and everybody would have to look after themselves, basically. It's a free for all if there are no rules. But beyond that, if it's a civilizational uh, confrontation, if it's a question of going back to where the world was in the previous century, great power rivalry and conflict, uh, even predating the colonial times, predating certainly United Nations and everything else, then we are in a sort of a jungle uh, of the fittest. And the big guys, the people that we always say, that the, the, the elephant in the room, the dragon in the room, will be the ones who determine uh, things. And that perhaps is what we should be fearful of, because then it means certainly, uh, and I'm being quite pessimistic, just, just to sort of you know, uh, arouse uh, in, a, in the late afternoon uh, some, some interest, that, uh, well, then this is not the future that uh, we are hoping for our children and grandchildren. This is not the future uh, society that we hope to be living in and that we have bought into in the post-World War II era uh, of openness, of democracy, human rights, of uh, opportunities for everybody. So I think that is the geopolitical landscape, uh, Mr. Chairman, when you said what came to your mind immediately when you saw geopolitical landscape of Asia. These concerns, this volatility, this uncertainty, and it's not between the red corner, white, uh, blue corner, but it's a mix, it's a gray area in many, many ways that is of, of great concern. 
And I'm sure that the countries of this region are not used to that, are not used to that. They would like options. They would like to play around. They would like to sort of you know, uh, hedge their bets uh, and, and take all sides uh, and not to have to make a choice. But the question now, I think, moving now, next year for Horasis, next year when we come together, is that whether we would have a choice in any case, whether the choice will be made for us somewhere far away and we then just have to live with it. And just the last point then, I think, in terms of the security geopolitical structures in this region, if there's a retreat from multilateralism, TPP no more, Paris Climate Accords no more, uh, UNESCO out, uh, Human Rights uh, Commission out, APEC for the first time in 25 years, no agreement, no consensus, maybe even ASEAN, Singapore, Mr. Trump did not show up, well, which might have been good uh, for, for the success of the meeting, but still it sent a s signal that Ah, are these institutions that we have used uh, being lived with and give us some comfort and security, sense of security, are they sort of disappearing? And what would take their place? Economically, Asia strong. The middle class, upper class of Asia will be the most important economic factor in the world, overtaking the American middle class very soon, maybe within just two years. And that is what President Trump said, I will not allow this to happen uh, on the 7th of November when he gave that press conference after the midterm elections. So for us, I think uh, whether Asia can run into the future on one leg, one leg meaning economic, we're doing well economically, very good, excellent investment, trade. But to be able to move into the future or even run into the future with confidence, with stability, I think we need two legs. And what is missing is the leg of geopolitical security architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting it rather art articulately laying it all out there for the rest of the session. I think one of the things that you talked about towards the end is something Ms. Nin will, will be talking about, that for the longest of times, Asia, particularly in this part of Asia, Southeast Asia, has seen stability or predictability, so to speak. And a lot of, a lot of things have been turned on their heads. And there is, as you pointed out, a degree of uncertainty around how, how the geopolitical, geostrategic scenarios are going to play out. Uh, Ms. Nin. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Chutukul uh, mentioned things that I also intended to, to mention. So uh, it allows me, therefore, to perhaps add a few perspectives to that. The first is that um, with the new configuration in the region, uh, it may mean that alliances, the very nature of alliances, is shifting. In other words, you know, uh, uh, an ally in all things, that kind of ally, you know, may be revisited. And therefore, perhaps, especially all of us, the smaller, con the medium and smaller countries, were thinking, well, perhaps alliances to be realistic and adapted to the, the new geopolitical context need to be temporary sometimes and circumscribed to certain interests, fields, issues. In other words, it's very modular. So, you know, set in stone, uh, A is the definite long-term uh, unchanging ally of B, that kind of configuration, I think, is being revisited. 
And some people therefore say, because there are two elephants now in the room, perhaps not uh, exactly the same, but definitely who will say that in the Asian room there is still only one elephant? In fact, there's two elephants or two dragons, I don't know, whatever you want to call them. And therefore, I think, uh, 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 and in view of the uh, unpredictability of one of the elephants, then it's really a tightrope exercise. The other elephant, there is also an element of unpredictability, although I call it uh, strategic unpredictability more than perhaps, uh, you know, the American unpredictability, whom will, time will tell us, you know, whether it will last for beyond a certain administration. So what I'm saying is the, uh, China rising uh, is a fact of life. What we want, and China has been biding its time. For those of you who, who have watched carefully, at the United Nations General uh, um, Security Council, you know, because I was a multilateralist, uh, before I retired, and I was interested to see how China voted or sh showed its stance in a very careful and often neutral way, you know, on Iraq, on this, on that, you know, not really uh, sticking out its neck. But with the uh, One Belt, One Road, one road with the buying of a port in uh, Piraeus, uh, Greece, you see what I mean? Definitely, uh, China uh, has uh, bidden its time and it's moving out beyond its uh, first region, which is this part of Asia. Um, the forcefulness of Asia, assertiveness of Asia in the South China Sea, of course, is a matter of concern, of interest and concern, not just to the countries of the region, but beyond the, the region. But again, therefore, the unpredictability is there with both elephants, but of a slightly different nature, uh, because for the, uh, the American elephant, we don't know uh, what will happen uh, if there's a new administration in a few years' time. In the case of China, it's more trying to read into the tea leaves uh, in the grand scheme of things how, they, how fast, how strong they are going to move. But if later the chair, you know, the moderator moves into the one belt, one road issue I'm quite interested in, we can perhaps try and analyze through our analysis of how it is moving the kind of uh, I don't know, roadmap that perhaps the, the local superpower, or regional superpower uh, is uh, thinking of. The second point uh, I'd like to make is, from this, uh, is the, the American uh, superpower elephant indispensable? Because this notion has been with us in the region for a very, very, very long time. But today, you know, there are, it seems that there are a few nations in our region that are thinking and acting as well, perhaps not necessarily. Is the US superpower now considered indispensable in the regional geopolitical context by all? By most, I think, yes. But by all, perhaps not. So we need to look a bit more closely at the um, specific circumstances of each country. And then, you know, the answer will differ from one country uh, to the other. You just uh, look at Sri Lanka. I'm sorry, I don't, shouldn't mention names. But we could, you know, look at certain cases in, in, the, in the region. Now, my third point would be uh, to say, uh, and, and I would add that the, the, the power politics, as Ambassador Tutko mentioned, uh, that uh, the US, current US administration is relying on, uh, you know, 
what's the kind of pressure, you know, are you either you're with us or you're against us, might push people to choose rather than let them be comfortable, you know, doing a delicate balancing. But if, if you're being pushed to the wall and you've got to, to say you're either with us or you're against us, who knows what will be the, 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 you know, the response of certain countries. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make is that the new confederation is offering or is uh, posing uh, different challenges and opportunities for certain countries in the region. I think that for Japan, I stand to be contradicted, uh, but I think that for Japan there is some kind of opportunity. And I want to cite the R. Um, uh, CPTPP, meaning that when uh, the U.S. withdrew from TPP, uh, Japan took the lead to, to sort of uh, save uh, the, the configuration, uh, and uh, it's been a, a success. And from what I read in the press, uh, it would seem that they have been uh, tiptoeing from certain parts of the U.S. administration, you know, about uh, who knows, we might want to get back into it. And it seems that for the time being, the house, the smaller house is in order, let it try and, and uh, you know, survive as in that format, we might not necessarily uh, need, uh, you know, the bigger elephant into the house right away. So this is what I, my comment about the notion of this indispensability, you see. So a kind of uh, opportunity for Japan to have a more prominent role, more proactive role. Uh, I would say the same of ASEAN. Uh, regardless of the uh, objectives, uh, facts and figures about our, our, our you know, population, our economic weight, and so on and so forth, but uh, ASEAN, uh, after all, because of the stability, steadiness of its economic growth, uh, because of its also, uh, I think, uh, reliable um, will uh, to play a positive role in the region, uh, I think uh, ASEAN, it's in that context of uncertainty, certainly, you know, it's favorable for ASEAN to to assert itself and, and be accepted as an element of stability and a kind of reference uh, for other countries. And finally, the third is Korea. Now, Korea, uh, the new of the current configuration offers it both a challenge and an opportunity. It is very interesting and telling to see how uh, the president of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, you know, has been, you know, managing uh, in a rather, I think, very smart but difficult way, a role for South Korea that is not wholly sort of towing, you know, uh, the timeline or, or the, the methodology of of, uh, of Washington. So again, uh, but of course at the same time it poses a definite challenge because the, it's such a big, big, you know, issue that it is definitely a challenge. But again, as in the case of Japan, I think we see uh, in South Korea, uh, Republic of Korea, an opportunity for assertiveness, for assertiveness of trying to take its, the matter into its own hands to the extent that it, it can in, and along certain, uh, let's say, with certain provisos, of course. So these are uh, some of the few thoughts I, uh, I have. Uh, if later we speak about the OBOR, One Belt, One Road, uh, I will provide a couple of uh, information and, and uh, thoughts, particularly the dilemma of uh, being in or out of OBOR. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Nin. Uh, I think we will definitely, I think, no discussion of 
the future of Asian geopolitics can be complete without referring to the Belt and Road Initiative and its implications on the economies in the region. Also given you know, what Sri Lanka, Pakistan have been facing and you know, with Malaysia deciding to put on hold PRI projects, I think it is something that that is is going to be one of the defining themes for in Asian geopolitics in the years to come. Thank you so much for your for sharing your views and uh, coming to Japan now, which is you know, often perhaps often not recognized sufficiently well enough as a key player in the region. You know, its its role, as Ms. Nin has explained, in a lot of ways has become more prominent now, and we'd like to have. Uh, Professor Taknaka talk more about it and provide his perspective also on the risks for the region okay. emanating from the US-China trade war. Okay, thank you very much for having me here uh, this evening. And also thank you very much for your encouragement on the role of Japan. And uh, I, well, there is um, BRI and the other, well, we I mean, Japan came up with different initiatives, which is called Free and Open Indo-Pacific Strategy. And so I would like to uh, refer to that. But um, before going to that, when we speak of geopolitics, I think last year at Kolkata, we talked about North Korea and also Chinese uh, rise of China as a, as a uh, superpower in the region. And um, when, in this year, I think there are two issues. One is, I mean, China continues to stay as an agenda. And, and uh, the other issue is, of course, um, the rivalry or tension between United States and China. And this is a mutually related issue. And uh, so I'd like to start with the first one. And uh, China, as we, I think me, many people in the room are already, uh, uh, aware of this, but the uh, Chinese has been expanding its influence in East China Sea, South China Sea, and also Indian Ocean. Uh, it has been strengthening its claim on Senkak Islands and penetrating into territory waters with um, their coastal guard ship. And also, uh, it has been conducting its large-scale land reclamation and construction of artificial islands and with um, development of airfields uh, in South China Sea uh, with a uh, lot of reefs. And also, um, China has been uh, attempting to increase the number of ports it can use in the Indian Ocean since the beginning of this century with its BRI. Uh, BRI. It has been developing port facilities in Colombo, uh, Hambon Tota in Sri Lanka. I think it's very it has become very famous by now, and also uh, Guadalu Port in Pakistan, Chittagong in Bangladesh, and so forth. There are many ports, and um, this the, and this and the second risk is increasing tension between China and the United States, and this is uh, has very become conspicuous by the speech made by Vice President Pence at Hudson Institute last month this year. And the US concern is expressed in the following remarks by Vice President Pence, and I quote, America had hoped that economic liberalization would bring China into a greater partnership with us and with the world. Instead, China has chosen economic aggression, which has in turn emboldened its growing military. And the United States increased concern, uh, I think there are three reasons uh, for the US concern. One is rapid economic uh, growth. And second is more, more, I think it's more importantly, it's uh, rapid technological development in China. And uh, some Japanese business people have told me that there's nothing new in Silicon Valley anymore. So you have to go to Shenzhen these days. I mean, that kind of comment I think something that Americans would not like to hear. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, third is because China attempts to expand its sphere of influence, as I have just explained with initiative. I have just mentioned, referred to uh, Indian Ocean, but they have many plans in, in Pakistan, in Central Asia, uh, in Siberia, and so forth. And um, so the friction has become already apparent by the trade war between the United States and China. 
Uh, but I think uh, there may be increasing tensions in the military dimension in, in future years. And uh, that, and so that, but I think this offers Asian countries risks and opportunities. Well, you might wonder what kind of opportunities are there, but I start with the risks. And I think the United States is very much concerned with the rapid technological development in China, and they might pressure on companies in uh, Asian countries, including Japan, to reduce ties with China. And I hear many stories about from Jap uh, my friends in Japanese companies that they feel subtle pressure from the United States to, to reduce cooperation with Chinese companies on uh, IT, uh, in intelligent technology and so forth. So that might they might do the same to Singaporean <laughs> companies or Korean companies and so forth. And the other thing is that um, the growth of Chinese economy has been so important for the growth of Asian economy. And if the, t the trade tension, I mean the economic friction with the uh, United States might uh, jeopardize their growth, that will have uh, negative repercussions on Asian economy as a whole, including uh, Japanese economy. And, um, but uh, having said that, I think the rivalry between United States and China may provide with uh, some opportunities. And um, first of all, uh, there have been a concern that United States might desert Asia. And uh, this was, I think, one of the motivations why Singapore, Singapore government pushed uh, TPP to have United States stay in Asia. But I think now the United States is so much concerned with the rise of China, I think it's pretty much certain that they are going to stay in the region. And um, the second is that uh, for, it, for ASEAN countries, many non-Chinese companies may shift their factories to ASEAN from China. That may be an opportunity. And the third is, more importantly, that rivalry between United States and China bring more money into the region. Because there are two competing initiatives. One is, advocate, one is BRI, as which has been already mentioned. But the other is uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. This is, well, there may be, well, I think Japan um, and our prime minister has been very provocative about this uh, strategy, but um, he may not have been influential enough. So I just, I, may, I might give you some facts. And uh, Prime Minister Abe announced free and open the Pacific strategy two years ago at uh, TICAD. Uh, that's a um, conference to discuss cooperation between Japan and uh, African countries. And it announced that uh, Japan would provide $30 billion to Africa, African countries between 2016 and 2018. And uh, this initiative, or uh, the Asian free and uh, free and open the Pacific strategy is like Japan would like to contribute to the development of a region which respects liberty, freedom, rule of law, sovereignty, and market economy. And uh, I think the United States joined this strategy uh, when uh, President Trump uh, visited this country last November, and he endorsed the idea of this free and open the Pacific strategy. And um, for at the beginning, it was just nominal. But now, Japan is ready to offer, provide more financial resources. And also, the United States, they have changed their financial institutions. They have set up new financial institutions to provide more loans to development of infrastructure. And now it is uh, $60 billion. And Japan is also uh, going to expand its official development assistance by 10% in the next year's budget. And so, you, I think there ASEAN countries can just exploit, exploit, I say exploit, you know, Japan and the United States on one side and China on the other side, and which, which of you offer a better deal to ASEAN countries or even to India. But, well, that may, I have, I have maybe exaggerating a bit, but the fact is that it is for certain 
does the financial resource, there will be more financial resources coming into ASEAN, South Asia. And, um, and also, Japan and the United States have, I, and let me pose one question. Who is the largest recipient of multinational financial institution? Does anyone in the room have an answer? Yes, good answer. Often China is the largest recipient of World Bank or ADB, and the Japanese government and the American government have become aware of this fact. And I think we are going to divert these resources from China to India or ASEAN countries, and that's probably good news for India and ASEAN. So that's, uh, that's uh, so since I think two, two panelists have uh, kind of uh, referred to risks, I would like to highlight that there are some opportunities uh, for, for the region. And um, thank you very much. And the last thing is um, about TPP. One thing I would like you to, to understand about Japanese policy formulation process is that we, this is really, in the post-war history, this is really the first time that Japan took some initiative in uh, economic, uh, external economic policy formulation. And I look at closely the domestic change in Japanese domestic politics, but we could, Japan, it, be, it has become possible for Japan to make, take initiatives because the power of prime minister has become uh, strengthened as an institution. So I think Japan probably, there will be second TPP or third TPP in which Japan uh, can take, uh, make more, uh, exercise more leadership in the region. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. I think that sets the stage really beautifully for a, for a discussion we've had, we've covered a wide array of topics, you know, we've covered the Belt and Road Initiative, what, where ASEAN fits into all of this, China-US relations and ties, the role of Japan, is it going to become a more prominent player in the region, talked about the, about the creation of, of institutions in Asia, whether that's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, another organization that we haven't talked about, or initiative is the Chiang Mai Multilateral, Multilateralization Initiative. Uh, so we've, we've covered it from a political perspective, from a spheres of influence perspective, as well as from an economic and trade perspective. I'd now like to, you know, time short, so I'd like to open it up to the house and, you know, if you have any questions, specific questions for any of the panelists, specific panelists, that'd be great. John, if you have the first one. Thank you very much, Sid. Since we all like to have a nice open discussion, I might make a few comments in defense of Donald Trump. I know that's unfashionable these days, but uh, regarding the trade war, of course, there are many dimensions to the trade war, but Trump has always said that he believes in free, fair, and reciprocal trade. And reciprocal is the key word. And Trump is right. Trade between America and the rest of the world has not been reciprocal. Uh, the American market is much more open than the Chinese, Japanese, European, and many other markets. And, uh, and you know, through the WTO, um, you know, America has not been able to gain as, as much market access as other countries have. And, uh, and I think, in that regard, you know, it's almost fair on the behalf of the Americas to push other countries to, to open up more. I'm not saying that that would improve the trade deficit at all, but it's fair enough to push. And so um, that's point one. Secondly, there's lots of talk about the trade war and protectionism now. The reality is that the protectionism has been rising since the global financial crisis of, of 2008. Protectionism didn't start last year. And protectionism has been rising in uh, uh, all the Asian countries, basically, and in the rest of the world. So it's not just something that uh, Donald Trump has been doing. Um, China, of course, has been making in Xi Jinping beautiful speeches on the multilateral system and globalization and so on. But this is just poetry. It's romantic poetry. The idea that China supports globalization or, or the multilateral system is just not true. 
and uh, yeah, the Chinese market has been so closed. And if you speak to, to business operating in China, under Xi Jinping, it's been getting worse. Um, and there's lots of talk about you know, Trump becoming isolationist. And of course, it's probably half true. But you know, again, it's this reciprocal word. From Trump's point of view, other countries that he has uh, alliances with have not been pulling their weight. And the main problem there is Europe. And of course, he has been pushing the Europeans to spend more on defense, as Obama did. It's not new, but he's pushing them more strongly. And that's a good thing. And that's good for the Europeans to be more self-reliant. Um, on um, you know, the, the Belt and Road and these sorts of things, you know, the recent APEC meeting, there was lots of press on that regarding the, uh, the communique and this sort of thing. But from China's point of view, the APEC meeting was a flop. You know, uh, picking up on what you were saying, of course, uh, Papua New Guinea and other Pacific Island countries, they were more keen on getting finance from uh, US, Japan, Australia than from China. And so um, yeah, China didn't have many friends at that meeting, whereas the, the democratic country, countries did. Um, and the last minor point, uh, Takanaka-san mentioned about uh, there are no more innovations in Silicon Valley, it's all now in Shenzhen. Maybe that's true, but I've also heard that China is the biggest investor today in Silicon Valley. And so there must be something happening there. Mm -hmm. Because our Chinese friends are very good at uh, you know, stealing or buying technology whenever they can. So that's just a few comments uh, in defense of Mr. Trump. And I'm not American, I'm Australian. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I make a few comments? First, I'm a chairman of an uh, NGO based in China, but I'm a, <laughs> a Chinese Canadian. I want to make three points. Point number one, I visit Bolivia and uh, Ecuador. When I go there, they say, please, ask Chinese government to come. You know why? Bolivia and Ecuador, they sell export agriculture product. If no one is buying them, they're starving. They don't make Xerox machines. So they've been explored by the United States for a long time because America is not buying their coffee. And a Xerox machine they buy from America is very high price. So the politicians send their sons and daughters to America with the poor people getting poorer. So what they're saying, if we can export agriculture product to China, like, uh, you know, uh, whatever, soybeans, then they can improve their standard of living. They can uh, buy cheap Chinese product. So comment number one. Uh, I don't want to defend Chinese government, you know, I'm just a businessman. But uh, I want to say is, let's look at history. Before China had 1.3 billion poor people, everybody's poor. You cannot afford a, <laughs> a bottle of water, Coke. But now, the poor people in China become less, like about 30 million, 50 million. I look at ASEAN, you know, I'm really impressed. So many top, bright people, sharp people, really intelligent. So I look at the past 30 years, the whole ASEAN standard of living is improving, China is improving, everybody is getting better off. So what has happening, the trade war between China and America is this. China is becoming a housemate for America. They wash dishes, uh, dirty laundries, you know, pollute the water, pollute the, this. How much money they make? 30 cents. Each iPhone, America makes 70 or 80 percent, China makes 3 percent. So they work hard. So why are they doing these dirty jobs? They need U.S. dollars to buy crude oil. They need U.S. dollars to buy iron ores. But now they're trying to maybe swap a deal with Japan, with other countries. They can use RMB to buy crude oil. So some people in China are thinking, maybe we don't need America as much because they make peanuts, Americans make 200,000, 500,000. They say, why don't we do business with Asia? Why do we do business with Japan? Why do we do business with Korea? You know, just like a housemaid, they say, I don't want to be your housemaid. I just start my own uh, ice cream shops. So I look at ASEAN, you know, it's winning the next the future, ASEAN is winning because, as the professor say, as everybody say, is there's a lot of allies. ASEAN can choose, make friends with Japan, make friends with China. They can do 
because a lot of high tech in the America, ASEAN can do. I use Grab, very successful. You know, I don't need to use uh, Uber because a lot of ASEAN's unique natures, they can learn technology from Japan, from China, from Australia. They can do, they can be their own master. So I'm saying ASEAN will have a lot more friends. They don't have to take choice, just being polite. You just don't offend America, they are number one. You don't want to offend China, you don't want to offend Korea or Japan. So you can be friends. And I think China, you know, the government is changing because I look at China, not at the government side, but I'm looking at the 5,000 year history. We, we all understand. In China, they're saying, called 100 rivers come to the ocean. The government is learning. Every day is changing, like uh, Dozi and Gabbana, whatever. Everything happened. All the policy makers are changing. They, they want to, you know, like if you look at WeChat, everybody's saying, why? Why is Japanese so polite? Why is Japan so environmental? Then people say, why is the uh, Philippines so nice? Why is this? So the whole country citizen, you know, middle class, like uh, 400, 500 million, they are learning. And they put the pressure on the government to change. So what I'm saying is the next few years will be the golden years for everybody. Now, last comment I want to make about United States. I was educated in the United States. I love the United States. Everything's good. But the United States has become Richer is getting richer. So we all know 4% of the people in the United States, they take, what, 35, 40% of the global resources. They don't want other nations to get up. They want a copy price to be down, everything goes down. And even in the United States, I talk to Americans. You guys read a book called Dirty Money. They say, wow, the big corporation, the coach brothers, they changed the policy. So even the Americans living in America, their standard of living is dripping, coming down. So what I'm saying is, you know, I'm a Buddhist. The idea is bring equality to everybody, even to the poor people in the United States. Their standard of living has been coming down, has not gone up. And I think the stand, everybody need a job in ASEAN, people need a job in Africa. So China rising up, I'm not defending China, has some benefit because they create jobs by building the roadways, people can export their agricultural products. So make the long story short, next few years will be golden age for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. I think, I think one, one of the important things to point out is that I think global uh, inequality is, is a global phenomena and I think it's, it's a pressing problem, perhaps as much a problem within China as it is in other parts of the world. So I think it's very important to establish that, that it has potential implications across the world, geopolitic, political implications domestically is another matter. One of the things that you pointed out, I would like to get, uh, I'd like to get, I'd like to get Ambassador Chutkul to comment on that is, it, it ties in, because it ties in with what you were talking about that, you know, one leg is great, which is the economic leg, but politically can, can the region come together? And when we think about ASEAN and the, all the, talk that we've had around ASEAN right now, it seems to assume that, you know, it is one block. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to anything political, it isn't. And do you think that going forward, and this ties in with the BRI, we are going to see a situation where countries within ASEAN are going to be stretched in different directions, pulled in different directions, or whether BRI initiatives are in keeping with the master plan on ASEAN connectivity, for example. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic wherein as an economic union, it is increasingly powerful and continues to grow. But politically, do you see it moving in different directions? Is that a possibility? Well, certainly, yes. Uh, I, I think we, on a spectrum, we have uh, optimists and pessimists and maybe a realist uh, a lady uh, right in the middle there. Uh, but just to throw out these ideas, I think, I don't think we have a definitive answer for all the issues uh, that we are faced with now, except an agreement that the times, they are a changing, that there is volatility, there is concern, there is, you know, things that we do not understand. 
and not confident about, uh, about the course of the future. You mentioned ASEAN. I think one country at least has made a choice already. That's Cambodia. Uh, will the others follow? Maybe they will have to make a hard-nosed assessment of where their interests lie. Within ASEAN, I would say we have to see the image of ASEAN that is not generally felt is that ASEAN is a majority Islamic organization in terms of numbers of people. So that is a fissure that, that, you know, that we have to be very careful of. Let me bring up one outlier issue. Uh, because we are in the 100 year anniversary of the end of World War I armistice. World War I just happened. Because some Serbian mad fellow shot an Austrian archduke and everything then, all the dominoes fell, all the alliances, everything, everybody then got into it. You know, uh, even workers from China went, a uh, million soldiers, uh, fighters from India went, Vietnam uh, had, had people fighting for the French and all that. And, and Japan was fighting with the Allies uh, in World War I. So we can't uh, be complacent, I think, that uh, within this region of Southeast Asia, for example, I've been doing a lot of work recently on the Rohingya issue. Rohingya chased out of Myanmar, an ASEAN member, on the border with uh, Bangladesh, the biggest refugee camp in the world now, 1.2 million people, uh, totally nowhere to go, living on subsistence, handouts by the international community, which is getting less and less every day. And every day, 65 babies are born in those camps, not seeing anything for the past four or five years now, no other life. We can see that this, for example, this saw in Southeast Asia, uh, in spite of all the prosperity going on around it, uh, could be an outlier issue. There is concern that, for example, it could be like the Palestinian refugee issue uh, uh, in the Middle East. This Rohingya could be for Southeast Asia, and we see the Middle East eventually turning into a region of perpetual war. Some of us, not many, uh, can remember Lebanon, Beirut, Paris of the East, now totally almost in ruins. They had uh, people living together, many religions, ethnicities, everything was going fine. The good life in Beirut, Lebanon, you know, Jordan, Amman, and all that. But now it's almost total war. The first country, civilization, world, Babylon, Iraq, Syria, all, you know, uh, uh, in a perpetual state of uncertainty and, and, and uh, stress. If the Rohingya, for example, issue on the border, the narrative becomes a Buddhist majority oppressing an Islamic minority. Then we can get the OIC involved, Islamic world, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, sort of, uh, and, and the people there, the kids growing up there, very susceptible uh, to, to being sort of uh, made into extremists uh, and radicalized. Uh, and then the knock-on effect would be Thailand, another Buddhist country, very close to Myanmar, seen as helping even very close to Myanmar military. Uh, they could lash out and then it not on affect Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then perhaps even break up ASEAN into a northern Buddhist so-called uh, ASEAN and the southern majority Islamic countries. So those are, are the fault lines that we have to be very careful of because big numbers, growth, GDP, and those kinds of things tend to cover uh, those, uh, uh, the cleavages. So I think, yes, I think those, we do need to reinforce uh, coming together. So any hint of breaking up, of not having a multilateral setting, not coming to an ASEAN plus, as ARF, East Asia Summit, APEC, if it goes away, is very concerning because then we're all left 
to our own devices, and each one, a country is like an individual, they make their own choices. So as I said, now one perhaps most, I don't know whether it, there is a, 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 a representative or a national of, of Cambodia here, but uh, they, they are quite cl clear. Uh, one very good friend told me even, and just in confidence, you know, this is Chapter House rules, I think. So, so three years ago, I think three or four years ago, ASEAN had a similar problem like APEC. For the first time ever, no joint communique came out of an ASEAN ministerial meeting which was held in Phnom Penh because of an issue of wording. China again was involved uh, on, South, uh, on the South China Sea. A good friend of mine said, look, we had to make a choice. We think to ourselves, historically, even now, who are the existential threat to the being of Cambodia? Historically, and even now, they say, is Vietnam has invaded, have gone back and forth, and Thailand going back and forth, the two countries <laughs> taking advantage of uh, something in the middle. So they said, if one of them again invades, who can we count on? Can we call on ASEAN? Can we, do you think that US will come to our aid? Only China will be able to do something for us, they say, in their calculation. So this is their own choice, and you can't blame them for coming to that conclusion. So these various choices will be made in a situation where there is no overarching multilateral forum mm. for people to work out their differences uh, and to have confidence in that, yes, wow, look, this, these people, uh, ASEAN, it's not, of course, like EU or NATO, but those concerns we, we can see replicated even in Europe with the Brexit and other, uh, other things. Who is going to have my back? Where does my future belong? And if we don't quickly try to provide answers for that, you're going to see people going all over the place. Uh, and that, again, uh, you know, one market, one group, one consumer group, one, all this, we all go uh, overboard. And we're all going back to a situation, again, like uh, World War I, Europe, 100 years ago, uh, and going back to this issue, the outlier issue of the Rohingya, very below the radar at the moment, but very sensitive within the ASEAN, uh, within the ASEAN grouping. It's not said publicly and all that, but again, this could be a disruptor, uh, a game spoiler uh, within the ASEAN uh, grouping. Uh, so there, you know, this is the pessimistic side of it. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions for any of the panelists? Yes, please. Hi. Hi, my name is, is Jim. I'm a Chinese American, I'm currently based living in Manila, Philippines. Um, and just questions for actually all of the panelists from an um, education and public education perspective. You know, we, we, we talk about the Asia Pacific region. I think that a lot of the panelists have, have talked about how potentially volatile it is. There are certainly a lot of antagonisms that go and stretch back hundreds and hundreds of years. And, um, and it's, not, it's not getting more uh, simpler. It's potentially getting more complex. And if you look at the, um, in terms of how uh, folks are educated, both from a public education perspective and also in terms of what um, is happening potentially in primary and secondary schools, in terms of textbooks, in terms of um, the messages that are out there, in terms of social studies, for example, um, I guess my, my question is, uh, what are some of the things that can potentially uh, be done? What are some actions and action items that could be done to, um, for the future generations, for younger generations, and also for the, for the public um, to alleviate some of the tensions? And uh, you know, if we look at some of the, uh, to be more specific, if we look at some of the textbooks in China, in Japan, in South Korea, um, even for, uh, uh, pick any island, pick any island in the, in the Pacific, uh, South China Sea, um, the ideas, ideologies are very, very, very different. Um, and, and, and a lot of the you know, antagonisms 
are predicated on public opinion, public education, awareness, and thought and perspectives. How, um, what are some steps that could be done to potentially alleviate that and reduce tensions and antagonisms? Thank you so much for your question. Would, Ms. Lin, would you like to take it? Takunaka-san. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think to, to uh, abbreviate the tensions in the region, I guess uh, it's important to teach uh, different perspectives. Uh, for example, I have emphasized Chinese penetration into South China Sea, but from a Chinese perspective, maybe, you know, now the American, Amer I mean, the United States has been freely, f freely uh, navigating in South China Sea, and uh, it's a very important route for Chinese import of petroleum. So that why the Japanese or uh, the Koreans or uh, some people do not make, um, uh, do not criticize Americans for dominating South uh, China Sea. You know, it's for bi so vital for Chinese people to import oil. And that kind of perspective, you know, might probably, you know, uh, might help you understand uh, some other countries' policies. And so if, every country's people have, uh, can gain different perspectives. I mean, that might probably uh, contribute to mitigating tensions. Yeah, that's my take. Before I, I take up that uh, question, I'd like to get back to uh, what uh, uh, Mr. West mentioned about uh, uh, the fact that uh, it is understandable that uh, the Trump administration should be complaining about the unfairness of uh, uh, the commercial uh, relationship between the U.S. and China in particular, but with many other countries as well. What, I'm, uh, what uh, sort of uh, puzzles me is it's the U.S. which after 1945 more or less set up the whole multilateral Bretton Woods system. They didn't shoot themselves in the feet, did they? I mean, they were the preeminent superpower. They more or less, you know, well, I don't want to use the word dictate, but they, they had the upper hand in setting the rules of engagement, the rules of the game. And how come, you know, they set up a mechanism that was so they accept that it be unfair to them since then. So perhaps, I don't know, I'm, I'm no econo economist, and nor am I a trade expert. Perhaps there were, you know, uh, places in, in you know, uh, segments in, in that system, which perhaps the US uh, did not look closely enough at. But may I offer another uh, perspective? perhaps not just China, but also other countries got smart and knew how to apply <laughs> those rules of engagement in a way that, that uh, you know, uh, that benefited them a bit more. So in other words, what I'm saying, if, uh, I'm, isn't that paradoxical, I'm Vietnamese, I, I'm, I'm not defending China again. I'm just saying, uh, let's have a kind of historical perspective. I think the reaction is that perhaps the US administration is waking up to the fact that, you know, the chessboard has changed and that uh, many know how to make the most of those rules of engagement which were set up, you know, under the more or less the ages of, of the US. So, um, and frankly, I think I agree with you. All countries try to be protectionist when they can and if they, they can, you see. So it's just that the, there are new, new kids on the block uh, and it would seem to me that the reaction should be to take a closer look and, and be more, let's say, uh, not sort of uh, adopt such a wholesale approach, you know. Uh, perhaps China is uh, cheating on certain uh, issues, but along the, century, the nearly century that has passed, I'm sure the U.S. has taken advantage of its position of being, you know, the, super, uh, the economic superpower. In other words, at that game, 
I don't think there's only one cheater, you know, but everybody is trying to get the most out of, of the existing rules of engagement. What I hear is that uh, China doesn't want, I think, doesn't want only to maintain the system. I suspect it even wants to change some of the rules of, of the game because now it's part of the whole multilateral system. So just a thought that uh, uh, I wanted to mention. I also, before I move to that, the question of what you call irredentism. Uh, the reason why uh, there was no joint communique uh, at the ASEAN meeting in Phnom Penh, uh, I interpret slightly differently. It's not a question of Cambodia looking for salvation or, you know, uh, for a savior, uh, uh, you know, in China. Uh, it's more uh, a proactive stance, I think, from China trying to pull uh, Cambodia to to its side. You know uh, how it works. I mean, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the, the current administration in Cambodia intends to go into irredentism. You know, I mean, the provinces in the southern Vietnam that used to be Khmer, you know, but centuries ago, it's the same. Nobody would say uh, that Laos should, you know, reclaim some of the provinces that are now in in uh, Thai territory. So I don't think it's an issue of irredentism whereby Cambodia has to rely on China to defend its uh, uh, territorial sovereignty. So just a comment. Now if I come to the issue of um, education for the younger generation, let me share with you uh, a story. I attended a series of um, uh, Stanford uh, Trans-Asia Dialogue and, and the uh, Schorenstein Institute there uh, asked me as a Vietnamese, you know what, it's so difficult uh, to have a dialogue on re re revisiting textbooks uh, among Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. I mean, you can hear the tension, feel the tension in the room. It's very, very difficult. So they asked me, how did you do it with the Americans? In other words, we were foes. So how come uh, could Vietnam find a way to become sort of partners or, or any way, put the past behind or set the past aside and be in a, an ongoing friendly conversation with the US? Friendly doesn't mean that we agree on everything but we have found common, common ground. And so it seems to me that um, perhaps there should be an ability, I, I'm not here to give any precepts or advice, but my perception is that because of our you know, history of resistance to foreign intervention and aggression uh, and foreign rule, uh, and because we were the smaller country um, the, the moment the conflict was over, it was modus vivendi. Let's go and you know that. So when China, uh, the Chinese troops would uh, move out of Vietnam, we would bring, it was the uh, centuries ago, no, we would bring tribute to the imperial court to have, you know, uh, an accommodating relationship knowing that we have no illusion we're, we're the smaller, you know, uh, nation. And so perhaps this attitude of being, trying to be able and set aside the past to build the, the future together, it is something that, you know, we have had this uh, sort of fortunate ability uh, through time and through history. So uh, I don't know, but, uh, how to facilitate conversations among former adversaries in the region might be worth, uh, you know, uh, a project by one of those, uh, you know, think tanks or academic institutions. Just a thought again. Thank you so much, Ms. Nin. Uh, we have about 
10 to 15 minutes. So I'd like to take a couple more questions and then put them to the panelists all together. Lady yeah. there, please. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Yes, please. Hello. Um, I'm from, my name is Rose Sui. I'm not from um, politics background. No, I'm not a politician or no, pro I'm not a political expert. But I'm from Myanmar, um, the country that facing the um, diversity issues and also um, suddenly being criticized for all these um, Rohingya and insurgents and the, all the crisis that are happening in the country. And um, um, I very sympathize those refugees in the camp, especially my sympathies go to females and also the kids and the newborn babies. And um, also I, uh, my sympathies go to the new generation, the youth. For us is that our generation already existed, we already face it, experience it. And, but the new generation in our Myanmar, and that's more than the 50 million people. We are a young country, so the young generation's population is huge. So I'm also sympathize those generations because we were under military regime for years and years. I, I think that more than 70 years, and we don't know what is democracy. I don't know how good that democracy is. I don't simply naively don't know because I grew up in socialism and um, I went through uh, my good times in the uh, military regimes. I don't want to go back to the time. I'm so scared to go back, so scared to rewind five, ten years ago. And um, uh, we talk about the first session that I attend, they talk about diversity and inclusivity. And I'm very thankful to ASEAN countries who stay include the problem, problem child like Myanmar. We always have issues, issues is. And um, you know, the, our government, the new government, two years old, we are young democratic country facing a lot of issues. The, uh, many of the government, um, uh, the top authorities, they never rule a country, but they're politicians, they're activists. They have a big heart for the country and the people, and, but they didn't have the education to rule the countries, many of them, I would say. So the, um, now, that, as you all know, that suddenly, last year, things changed, and the whole world used to talk about how great the lady was, and how wonderful the Iron Lady, and so and so, but now, her name gone down to the you know, drainage and everybody talk bad things about the, her and that become a fashion. You got to talk something about her. Then so the, um, I understand she, she is in a difficult situation much as I um, sympathize the, our country and we like, you know, she came in and the issue that she got to face and um, who has done this? The military. The issue, the Rohingya issue, started with the military government. And the, the Rohingya, when we talk about the Yakai, and they, we lived together more than many, many years since I was born, I knew, you know, they, uh, some of them, they came, they migrate to Yango, and we go friends with them as well. Why suddenly they have that issue? And I, rem I know, if, as far as I learned, that the, uh, those Rohingya came in the uh, British time, colonial time. Another time is that uh, when there's a um, war between, in uh, Pakistan, and then they came as well. That was uh, late 60s and 70s. So the, um, they've been there for a long time. Why that issue triggered right away when our new government started? They're too young to rule the country. They're too um, early to let us experience, and then they're facing the issues. And my question is that, yeah. like, we aren't very naive. I am naive in the politics. 
the, here many of you are very experienced. If you are in the situation of our government, if you can put yourself in our government <coughs> situation, how are you going to resolve? I would like to sure. learn from here okay. so that I could share in the country. Sure. We will come to that question right away. I think I'm sure Ambassador Chutkul would like to address that. And I would like to take one more question from Mr. Wei and then we'll open it up again. Well, I'm not sure whether you have the, the, the time to address this second question because that seems to be quite an elaborate question already. But anyway, I just quite want to quickly forward this idea. We talk about the geopolitical situation. Now, um, one big force of influence is not necessary from politics. This day, you know that unicorns has been rising every other month, every month actually. So those unicorns are organizations, the startups that yield enormous influence. You know, just out of the blue over the last one, two years because of the business model and because of the funding from the VC industries, they begin to have the influence over a billion consumers, right? Some of those may be from the US, maybe from the China, uh, maybe lesser from the other countries, but even in ASEAN, they begin to see the rise of unicorns very rapidly. And these are the very potent source of influence that could actually be the new form of the government across the whole region because they can influence just through the app and people live the same lifestyle. Gone are those like Coca-Cola kind of lifestyle whereby people just want free and easy and all this kind of uh, uh, the thinking. These days, people are so dependent on the technology, on the apps and all this. So I just wonder how would all these unicorns interplay with the geopolitical uh, situation? Thank you so much for your question. We'll take that question from the panel. First, I'd like to get Ambassador Chutkul to you. It is a question which has plagued ASEAN, often swept under the carpet. Your, Myanmar is blamed for a lot of that's happening, but I think the question here is, you know, what, how do you think it can be resolved, and what are your views? I'm, I'm not sure you would agree with it being called a, a diversity issue, and so you know, what are you, we'd like to know your views, and if you could address the lady's question on how potentially could the first steps at least be taken to try and resolve the issue? Well, uh, of course, it's, it's a complicated issue, as uh, the lady said. Uh, it's a long-lasting historical. And of course, once we get into uh, you know, looking at uh, things, you know, uh, historical blame game, or, you know, trying to uh, have our own interpretation of history as such, uh, I, I think we eventually we'll be going back to Adam and Eve. Uh, who did what to who, and who was guilty, and who owned which part of land of earth. So I, I think it's very difficult, and it's be better, I think, to focus on the here and now uh, as much as possible, and only draw back on history in terms of those things that would help us to confront, to manage, uh, and to make sense of, of the present. So a lot of historical baggage everywhere, certainly, of course, um, and and on, on the Rakhine, Rohingya, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, you know, on helping this uh, Rakhine Advisory Board uh, 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 that was set up by Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, but uh, I had to withdraw because I, I didn't have any uh, comprehensive solution to present. It's a long-term one, certainly. It involves, again, cutting oneself off from the long baggage of history uh, uh, and then looking at individual human beings, I think. Uh, and the bottom line would be humanity. Whatever religion, economic uh, circumstance, uh, ethnicity, but if we can reduce everything to basic humanity of how one human being is supposed to treat another, I think that goes beyond all the systems, ideologies and you know, costs and benefits. Uh, and I, I think we have to take a step back and, and try to do that. And certainly there is hope in Myanmar, as you say. It's a young generation, young people coming up. Uh, and and we, I think we have to uh, try to work on that. Uh, uh, it's a hopeful one, although I did say to the Rakhine Advisory Board that I don't have the answers. 
and, and, and too old uh, to look at things optimistically to the future, but uh, 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 too pessimistic, but certainly for the young people. And I think it's very good that this question came up because that could be one of the answers, that the innovation, technology, new lifestyles uh, could, could I use the word Trump? Could Trump everything? Yeah, and, and bring about a whole new paradigm uh, of, of, of thinking. Uh, and, and hopefully that will be the trajectory uh, going forward. But in the meantime, I think we have to try to resolve some of the present circumstances uh, to create the understanding, the education, and all the, all the perspectives, and hopefully put faith in new technologies, new generation, uh, to do away with the baggage of the past, a lot of that, some of the past is good, but again, when we go back to the past, who did what to whom, and who did you know, who cheated who, who went who, who belonged to what, you know, which territory, uh, it gets a bit messy, uh, to, to say the least. Uh, and of course, we have put a lot of faith in United States, u pluribus unum, I think, out of the many one, diversity, everything getting together, doing away uh, with again the buckets of the past, they come over on the board, everybody is the same, eco. That is the idealism I think we all thought was represented by the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. But our concern is not to say, hey, you are bad, you are this and that, or you are to blame, but our concern is because we, we treasure that, we think back to that, and we think, wow, where, where has that gone? And where that, does that leave us? what is the alternative now that is in this region? And we have to be careful whether we will even have a choice, the ability to make a choice for ourselves, for our, our children, grandchildren, of what kind of life uh, they, want, they can live. So I, I think those two elements of, from the past, continuing problems of the past, those, the items, the issues, it, it goes well with this hope of a new paradigm, uh, technology, a new way of doing things that supersedes uh, some of the constraints and the considerations of the past. Uh, and of course, going back to ASEAN again, ASEAN, I talk about, and I think we talk about a lot of ASEAN because Singapore just handed the chairmanship of ASEAN to Thailand. Uh, very big shoes to fill because Singapore did so well. Uh, you know, it, it, it ended basically just by providing chili crab, uh, ended the threat of nuclear war that hang over all our heads. Uh, I hope that can be uh, you know, replicated again this coming year. Uh, and, but this coming year, I think there'll be elections in Thailand, uncertainty, elections, of course, in the biggest country of ASEAN, Indonesia. Uh, that would again uh, sort of mix up all the calculus uh, uh, with, for this region. And there, therefore, that's the word of caution uh, that I think I would like to leave uh, with you that look, we, we can't be complacent uh, even with new technologies, even with the growth rates, with increasing prosperity, uh, even with the greater closeness among all our peoples, uh, and that we always have to go back. I think we have a Sadhguru from India there uh, who can tell us basically the bottom line is humanity. If we go back to that, uh, I think it will serve us well moving into the future. That this is basically, again, it's about human beings interacting with one another, not basically nation, nation states who is right or wrong. But if we go back to those uh, values, uh, I, I, I think, which is of course very Asian, very Southeast Asian also, you know, South Asian. Uh, uh, and of course, going back, even if we want to say uh, to China, the, the first civilization uh, of this region uh, will also be very important. One last uh, uh, thought, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, when we talk about the rise of China, I think that a lot of the concern is that it's not the rise of China. It's about China coming back. It will be the first civilization, I think, that has come back. I don't want to make some politically incorrect comments, but uh, just as a tourist, let's say, when I go to Egypt, I look around 
hey, are these the guys who built the pyramids? Mm. Go to Athens. Wow, they're, they're, they're having a good time on the beach. Uh, did they build a police, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, the, what is that? Uh, Acropolis, and then gave us democracy and the Aristotle and, you know. Hmm. Go to Rome, Coliseum, and you know, the, the Romans enjoying pizza and everything. Hmm. But you go to China. Oh, yes. These, these were the guys who, in the civilization, the forbidden city, the great wall. And they will be coming back even greater than before. So I think that is the concern. On what basis, on what presumption, assumption, what are the rules of the game? And that is why a lot of concern is there now in the region, outside the region of what, what are we talking about? This is entirely almost new. It's not only new generation, new younger people, but something new in world history even, civilizational history. Thank you. Dr. Nankasan, Ms. Nin, last comments before we close. About the One Belt, One Road initiative of BRI, um, it may relate to what uh, Ambassador Chutikul just uh, mentioned. Um, let's say uh, the rise or what you call the kind of return of China, although I think it's not, it's not the return to the kind of China of those years, precisely what the message that I think uh, we, the countries closest to China, would like to send to China is the world has changed. So uh, China uh, re-emerging, let's say, re-emerging uh, in a different world. So I assume China uh, needs to, to be very uh, sensitive uh, to the reactions of the rest of the world. Uh, frankly, in a sense, when, uh, you know, the the U.S. rose to its, you know, world preeminence after the Second World War. The world was busy, most of the developing world was busy uh, getting its independence. You see what I mean? So, it, but the world of today, including with technology, is a different world. And so I think the message that the, the rest of us uh, would want to tell China is one, that China should be rising is only normal. I mean, nobody should, can dispute that or should dispute that right to emerge. If you have the economic muscle, then you will want a certain stature in regional and later in global affairs. That's the fact of, a fact of life. But as I say, we, the closest to China, we should tell China, well, the world is different. So the way you rise matters to us. Uh, but with the uh, BRI, uh, I wanted to share a small piece of information. I happened uh, uh, to be told that there is a uh, university alliance of, for the, or of the Silk Road, Start an initiative started by uh, Chinese University, Xiao Chong, I mispronounced, well, one Chinese university. And it regroups uh, 15 universities, eight from France, uh, one from Turkey, fr one from Jordan, one from Serbia, Croatia, Russia, and Italy. Now, just that tiny sample tells you what? Tells you that it's not about con all about concrete and infrastructure. It also means influence, uh, intangible, you know. It's not just tangible, it's intangible influence. The fact that this Chinese university was able to attract attention from f 15 universities from places so diverse, you know, Croatia, do you pay attention to Croatia and so on and so forth? 
uh, or Jordan even in our part of the, of the world. So I, I, I thought, well, what you can say about it is that China is very deliberate. The same thing that I said about China and the Security Council. China is very deliberate. So it's trying to reap benefits beyond just the renminbi or dollars. You know, it's really, you know, expanding its influence because when you invest in in the human capital, in the brains of, you know, uh, lecturers, professors, students, you are thinking long term. And they don't, and because they are not right here, they don't mind, they don't perceive, you know, uh, the, the uh, re-emergence or the rise of China as something threatening. So I think we need to be, um, I think, clear-minded that, uh, well, some parts of the world are less sensitive to some of the risks, to say the least, of the way China is, is rising. But at least we should recognize it's very deliberate. But because it has the right, uh, uh, it has a legitimate right to, to assert itself, now that it has the economic clout, I think we need to be smart uh, and we need to, I don't think we should isolate China, but we should engage China in a manner where we are candid, we have a can candid dialogue. And telling China what I uh, said, more or less, the world is different, so you can't move like a, a, a too heavy he elephant in the room, you know, and so it, the, mat the manner you rise matters. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think... Uh, Chairman, may I just offer 30 seconds uh, quick okay, idea? Okay, quick one, because otherwise... Uh, yeah. Right, because I think the issue of the refugee service is very important and also the use of technology. In fact, just to offer an idea, uh, there is this concept of e-citizenship. The biggest problem with refugees is, is this, they are stateless. When a stateless, they are without identity. Then they cannot get anything. No education, no bank account, and nothing can be done. So, you see, in the internet world, this day, Estonia, for example, and maybe Latvia, Latvia and a few other countries, they begin to introduce this concept of e-citizenship. You don't have voting right. However, you will have a digital identity. So, if there is a chance for Myanmar to actually provide the digital identity or e-citizenship to those refugees, and then that gives them that kind of standing in the international community. And then if they can, can get some form of uh, e-education, so then the people will still receive their education. And you know, if this can also combine with the effort of NGO, provide e-health and so forth, uh, and then coordinated by organizations like other ASEAN or United Nations, hopefully that could offer a way out because these people need to live their life, and I think the world needs to accept them. There's a room for everyone in this, in this world. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wei. And on, the, on that note, you know, I'm afraid we need to cut it here because the next session is going to begin outside, or may have started already. Thank you so much for an engaging discussion. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks a lot.